first question is uh, about in part a about uh, star clusters so you just need to mention the differences between open clusters and globular clusters now if you go back and look at the nodes the differences are clearly mentioned there right so you just need to go and uh, look at that lecture or you can uh, see the recordings as well if you don't remember and then uh, the second question is briefly explain how Hubble used the period luminosity relationship to measure the distances to nearby galaxies. And this is what I have discussed in uh, at the beginning of the, the chapter that I did few days ago about galaxies, how astronomers uh, discovered or found that there are other galaxies in the universe other than our own Milky Way, right? For that, we, they have used this uh, period luminosity relationship, specifically uh, the, the relationship coming from the the stars. And I have very clearly explained uh, the, the process. Now, what you should understand here is that you cannot just, you know, cram everything and remember and write uh, things for a question like this, right? So I have explained it to you by taking time. So what I need from you is to get the idea and understand how it is used. And then you have to explain it here, right? So that is the idea. So how do you explain a question like that? Uh, how Hubble used the period Lewis relationship to measure the distances? Now you need to tell that uh, the method that he has used the method is that you need to find a sepid star and then you have to measure the period of the particular sepid star. Sepid star is it change the brightness regularly so you need to uh, measure the period of that and then you know, you should know that there is this period luminosity relationship that you can find the relevant luminosity of that particular star using the period luminosity relationship right so that period luminosity relationship is a well established one it is there and if you remember you had these graphs and everything and if i it's not here but if i go back to your lecture notes in this window about the galaxies this is This was that lecture, and if you remember this uh, particular relationship, and these two three slides are enough actually for you to answer that question, right? Basically, explain what are sepid variable stars. And you don't need to tell actually what are sepid variable stars. You just need to get the idea and uh, explain how it is used to calculate the the distance, right? I mean, you may, you can actually plot the graph like this and explain it, it's okay. So what you have to do is you find the period of that particular star and then from this graph, you can estimate the luminosity at that particular star. So once you know, know the luminosity of that particular star, then you can use this equation to find the, the magnitudes. I mean, you don't need even to explain the equations. I mean, this particular, <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this particular diagram basically explained, I mean, the whole story that you need to answer this question, right? How to use the sepid to measure the distance. Now, that's what I have asked here, right? Briefly explained how Hubble used the period luminosity relationship to measure the distances to nearby galaxies, right? <coughs> so it's the same thing because the period luminosity relationship comes for the sepid variable stars. You find the sepid variable star, measure its period, and then use the period luminosity relationship to calculate the luminosity of that particular star. <laughs> Sorry. And then you have to measure the apparent brightness of the star and compare the luminosity with the apparent brightness. Now, you, you may also use this particular equation and tell that you can use that one with the period luminosity relationship, but then you have to so remember this extra equation, right? You don't have to do that if you go it in this way.
So that question is basically related to this part right here, but you cannot just remember everything and answer it, right? You cannot remember all these sentences and everything. No, you just need to get the idea how this is done, right? So that's what I need, not, not to uh, cram everything and put all these things that I have mentioned in the slides into the question, right? So that's not going to work, right? So one people, wow, me, you cannot remember everything, no, but you can read these four slides and understand how it works, right? Then that will be much easier because this equation right here to measure the distances, you already know that equation now, you know that you have to remember it from the previous, so from the previous uh, 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 lectures, right? So that is what important. Right, so that's why I just changed the last two lectures in such a way that I am going to give you the idea about how to write the, the answers for these type of questions. And also at the same time, you have, if you have gone through those recorded videos, it will be much easier to understand what I am telling you now, right? Now, the next question is, you can see that the sun's orbit around our galaxy once every 240 million years and the radius of the orbit is about 27,000 light years. You have to estimate the mass of the Milky Way that lies within the sun's orbit. If you, I mean, this is something that I have already mentioned in the, if you go down in these uh, lectures, so now you have the second one is RR LIRA. So you should have the idea that how we use the RR LIRA stars to measure the, the distances to the uh, stars inside the Milky Way, right? So that is the second story that we uh, discussed, right? And then we started talking about the structure of the Milky Way. And in that, if you remember, I had a so you have the motions of the star. So in, in summary, you have to you know, just get the idea of all these things, how the Milky Way is structured. Not, not that you have to remember each and every slide that all the information I have, but you have you need to get these basic ideas, right? <clears throat> now there, there is a separate even slide about the mass of the Milky Way. Now you can see that how I have uh, you know use this uh, Kepler's third law to measure the mass or so estimate the mass, right? So you basically have to use the same thing, but you should know how to use it, right? Other than that, you cannot do that, right? It's the, the it says the period that is once every 240 million years. So that is the period in terms of years. And then the radius is about 27,000 light years. So that is, that is given in terms of light years. Now, the next thing is you, when you need to estimate the mass, you are given the period and the distance. And you can just use this equation. The only thing is you need to make sure that you are using correct units here, right? There are certain equations in, uh, in astronomy that in order, for the equation to work in the correct way, you need to uh, plug or substitute the values from correct units. So this is uh, a law or an equation that you need to make sure that you are using the correct units. So I have not mentioned it here, but if you follow the lecture series from the beginning, if you go for this very beginning uh, lecture about the orbits and gravity, I have mentioned there what kind of units that you should use when you are using different forms of the Kepler's third law, right? So if you are using this form, there is a certain uh, way that you have to use it. Now that one, that, that information that you have to understand and keep that in mind as well, right? So if you used to do tutorial, then you probably have gotten the idea. But that is what important because I, I may ask the same question from different set of units, right? So then you have to convert it again in a different way. So this is why you cannot just remember a question and then answer, try to answer in the exam paper because it will not work in that way, right? So you have to understand. 
the, what kind of law that we have to use and then how to use it. So that is what is important, right? Other than that, just uh, remember the equation and try to plug the values not to work in astronomy. So that is why you have to understand it. Right? And then, uh, so that is that question. So I'm just uh, giving you references from the lecture towards these questions and how you can prepare for the exam and then at the same time, how you need to understand it, right? So I hope that now you can complete that part one in that way. So you can see that I am not giving you the answers or anything like writing answers here, right? So what I am trying to do here is try to explain how you can find the answers, right? So I am my aim is not to give you answers and just to show you the answers and then because I can, you know, just type it the answers and post it in, in any way in the LMA so that you can look at it, right? So you don't need me to do that. So you can do it yourself. Later, I may uh, upload the answers later, but uh, you, you have to work on yourself, right? Once again, you can see that just looking at the answers, if I post the answers, you will not be able to get anything out of that. But if you work yourself, then you can check whether those answers are correct or not, right? Because you will never get the same questions again in the exam, right? Now then I have a table here mentioning that the mass and the luminosity of the visible part of two galaxies A and B are given in the table below. So there is a table that has mass and the luminosity given. <clears throat> mass is in terms of solar masses, then the luminosity is in terms of solar luminosity. And my question is, Calculate the mass to light ratio of the two galaxies and conclude the morphology of each galaxy. Morphology is uh, which type of galaxy, right? <clears throat> so it could be an elliptical galaxy, it could be a spiral galaxy, something like that, right? Now, you need to decide how there are two things here. You need to know how to calculate the mass to light ratio and the next thing is you have to conclude the type of galaxy or the morphology. We used to tell the morphology of galaxy based on that value, that is mass to light ratio. Now you can see that there is a part that you have to remember here and there is the part that you have to understand here. So both these things will be checked in these questions, right? So there are certain uh, things that you have to remember as well. Now, how to write the answer for this question. Now, if you are actually smart enough, you can uh, just looking at the table and looking at what has asked, even if you have not followed this, you should be able to answer the first question because the first one is asking, calculate the mass to light ratio, right? So that means you can clearly see that for each galaxy, I have given the mass and the luminosity. Luminosity means basically the light intensity, right? So you should understand that you have to divide this value from this value, right? Only thing that you don't know is whether you have to do a unit conversion or something like that. And now for that, you, of course, you should have learned the context other than that you will not have an idea, right? And then based on that value, you need to decide which type of galaxy that you have to I mean, which type of galaxy will be this uh, a galaxy A and galaxy B? Now, uh, let me show you the, the section that I have taught you about this. I mean, if you remember, there is a separate section about the mass to light ratio, right? I mean, you can see it here on the screen. Now, what I am trying to convince you here is these questions in the exam paper is not something coming from coming from somewhere that you have never learned right so you can see that everything is in this note it's the the idea is it's not that you cannot remember everything here you have to i mean look at the notes and go to the lectures and then understand the content then you will know that i mean how to answer this question right now i have defined how to find the mass light ratio uh, and you can see I have specifically mentioned the units. Now this part, you have to remember it, right? 
a useful way of characterizing the galaxy is by noting the ratio of its mass to its light output, right? Mass should be in the units of solar mass and the light output should be in the units of sun's luminosity. Now, fortunately, in this question, they are given in the same units, solar masses and the solar luminosity. Then you don't need to worry about it, right? But if you, let's say, you have just in, this in terms of kilograms, then you have to first convert it to solar masses for in order for this to work, right? So those things you need to keep in mind, right? So I may ask a different question this time. Let's say just putting kilograms here, I will just ask, let's say you just multiply this value by, you know, two times 10 to the power 10, something like that, and then convert it to kilograms. And then I will ask uh, to find the mass to light ratio, then you cannot just divide the masses that are in kilograms with the luminosity of the solar luminosity. So that is wrong, right? So these are the things actually you have to, you know, keep and pay, pay your attention. Other than that, you can see that everything is mentioned here. Then you have this uh, uh, information that galaxies with, with star which star formation is still occurring have many massive stars and their mass to light ratio are usually in the range of 1 to 10. So that means if there are galaxies that a lot of star formation is going on, their mass to light ratio is low value. So that is normally between 1 to 10, right? And you can also, even if you don't know this particular fact, you can sometimes get the idea uh, when you know when you divide the mass by the light, if there is a lot of star formation is going on, you should get a larger luminosity. So that means this value usually will be a higher value. So you are going to divide the mass by the luminosity. So you can see that if the luminosity is getting higher, then this mass to light ratio will be smaller, right? So that's how you logically think about it. And then if the mass to light is ratio is smaller, so that means you can see that there should be a lot of light in this particular galaxy. So the reason for that you have a lot of light or the luminosity is higher is that there are a lot of ongoing star forming galaxies because they are the brighter ones. Now, if you remember the HR diagram on the top left hand corner, is that you have this large luminosity galaxies where you have a lot of star formation is going on because they are in terms of the spectral type, their spectral type is A and B type, if you remember those information, right? Now you can see that even though we separate all these things, these are logically connected to each other. So that is the reason for everything. In that way, you can tell that, okay, this galaxy A is a lot of, uh, have a lot of star formation inside there, right? So that is another way of art, another way that I can ask this question, right? You can see that. And on the other hand, this one, this value, uh, the value is, uh, we just have 10 to the power 6 divided by 10 to the power 6, the value will, seems to be 1, right? You, if you divide it, 1 each other. So it's also maybe a similar type of galaxy. I don't know. So let's see. <clears throat> so the first one is, uh, is it, uh, you can see that for the first one, the answer is actually 20, right? So if you did, uh, divide ma mass by the light, so that's a higher value. The second one, you have just one, right? 10 to the power 6 divided by 10 to the power 6. And, uh, and you can see that. If the mass to value is uh, ratio is 10 to 20 value. So the second one, that first one that you had in that table is around 20. So that means it should have mostly older stellar population. And because of that, older stellar population is mostly in elliptical galaxies. Now, if you look at uh, my lectures and also those recorded videos, you will uh, understand that uh, the, I, I, which I I have asked you to look at is that uh, even from this table, you can see that the mass and the luminosity is given here. So the luminosity from that also you can get the idea. You can see that the star population is uh, 
for the spirals you have both young and older stars for the ellipticals you have only older stars so that's why their mass to light ratio is higher because when you have old stars they don't you know emit a lot of light and because of that their light luminosity is you know smaller and because of that the mass to light ratio will go to a higher value like that right so you need to understand that again that idea so that's how you answer those type of questions right now the reason that i specifically choose uh, this question is that this part b c and d so they these questions are based on this last two, re two recorded lectures that i have asked you to go through right so the idea is if you have gone through those you will directly understand these questions when i tell you the things in detail but if you have not gone through it then it will be i mean you will not understand it right and i cannot make you understand if you if you are not studying right so the, that part but definitely there will be questions like this in the exam so you should actually go through those uh, lecture lecture videos and make sure that you understand those right so then i had a section about that we talked about the dark matter and the types of galaxies, spirals, elliptical, and uh, regular. So this recorded video actually had uh, information about these uh, different types of galaxies in detail, right? And here, so you can see that uh, for the spiral galaxies, I have mentioned the features. So go through and understand those. And then, uh, there are actually uh, different types of galaxies and then you have the elliptical galaxies and here also i have explained that uh, these elliptical galaxies do not have any spiral structure and uh, they have very little interstellar matter and this explains why young stars are absent so there are no young young stars are very rare to find in elliptical galaxies there may be exceptions but I mean, usually there are i mean very uh, small amount of young stars are there so that's why mass strike ratio is smaller you can see that if you connect all these things the questions are not that much harder right so there is nothing coming out of uh, these lectures basically only thing is you need to logically connect some points right so that's about you know so this is how you relate the lectures into these questions so that's why i needed you to explain some of these parts so make sure that you go through these notes this part right here we have not discussed in the class but i have uh, posted a recorded video for you as a reading uh, studying material so that you will study it and then try to answer the questions i mean that's the best way to you know uh, answer questions so uh, yes study best way to actually study right so anybody have any questions up to here i have basically explained how to answer this part a and part b then we will go through this part c d and e which will you know roughly cover the the content of the last two lectures so that i will explain some of these things based on uh, uh, the the notes so that you will have a better idea I mean, if you have gone through the lectures then you will understand this very clearly Uh, please uh, feel free to ask if any of you have any questions because if you have gone through the lecture notes, you may have questions, right? Uh, and recording as well, then you will get, I mean, some of them have a lot of questions actually, then you can ask those. So that's why I decided to rather than doing the same lecture again, you know, 
there is a recording you can go to it you now so that's why i gave you time here to ask questions and you know teach you how to answer the questions No questions. Right, so if you don't have questions, let me just look at the next question now, part C. It says about a story about a galaxy, right? So just I have it in the screen, so I will give you some time. Please uh, read through it before we discuss about that question. So what basically it tells you is that there is a galaxy. The distance to a galaxy is derived from its redshift. A line in the spectrum of a galaxy is at a wavelength of 400 nanometers when the source is at rest. If the line is measured to be redshifted by an amount of 8 nanometers, find the following. So it says there is a uh, according to your uh, our understanding, uh, normally a distance to a galaxy is uh, derived using its redshift. Now we have different methods to uh, derive the distances to galaxies. Now one of that was, uh, if you remember, to use this period luminosity relationship. That's what I have discussed in part A. But there is other there are other methods. So one of the methods that best work is. Uh, looking at the redshift of the galaxy, right? Then it says uh, there is a line in the spectrum of a galaxy. So if you get a spectrum of a galaxy, there is a line uh, at a wavelength of 400 nanometer when the source is at rest. So that means if the galaxy is not moving, the rest wavelength is 400 nanometers, right? However, when you measured uh, this particular line from a spectrum, uh, we actually have found that uh, the, uh, the measurement was redshifted by an amount of 8 nanometers, right? So then you need to find the following. Just give me a minute. There is a call coming from the university.
right so i am uh, i am back here and so let me uh, so let's uh, so we were looking at this particular question now you are given the redshift of the galaxy and you have to uh, find the uh, the actually this question is asking redshift and the receding velocity of the galaxy right so first you need to understand what is redshift and the, then you have to find the receding velocity so the, it says it is redshifted by an amount of 8 nanometers so you need to know what is redshift means right so let's look at now where do you have this information in your notes right uh, if, uh, I mean, up to now we have not, uh, you know, found anything you know, about the redshift of the galaxy in this particular lecture. So I know where is that. So let me uh, go through that particular part. So that is actually this last chapter. So that's why you need to go through these lectures. Sorry, everything will come in this last le lecture. What? So let me briefly explain you what we are discussing here. Basically, we are we will be talking about cosmology so we basically what uh, the questions that we would uh, answer here is uh, what about the universe as a whole the world how old is the university sorry the universe so that means uh, the age of the universe and then what did it look like in the beginning right so beginning how uh, was how was the universe how what how was it looked like and how has it changed since then how the universe has changed since the the beginning and what will happen to the universe in the future right so this these are the things that we will discuss in this particular lecture right and i have not i am not going to go through each and every detail because everything is well explained in your last uh, recorded video lecture that I have posted. So you can go to it's basically explain all these lectures. And uh, in here we I am first uh, try to explain about the expansion of the universe because astronomers did not know that the universe was expanding at that time before Hubble uh, had his observations. And uh, actually when Einstein was deriving this general theory of relativity, he has actually in mind that uh, the universe is static and because of that he introduced a new constant called cosmological constant which represent uh, a static universe however uh, then later we identified that the universe is actually expanding and the einstein was found to be wrong but then again in the late 1990s we have found that the universe is again accelerating right and because of that, this Einstein's constant came into play again. And then uh, uh, all these details are mentioned in this uh, recorded lecture, right? So I'm just uh, trying to give you the importance of looking at the lectures. If you have gone through, then you already know how to answer this question, right? One thing that we were actually looking at was uh, uh, age of the universe. And here it tells you how to calculate it. And if you go through that video lecture, I have explained it uh, very clearly. And then, uh, I just give me a minute here.
Right. Uh, actually, sorry about different disturbers. I'm getting a few calls today from the university. Right. Uh, so what I have discussed is that uh, here you get the uh, the idea about the acceleration, the universe, and then uh, how they found it, and about the expansion of the universe, those kind of uh, information. And then we have different models of the universe. Actually, I forget that there is one uh, <coughs> lecture that we need to look at if we, we go into this part that is about the distribution of galaxies where you have these equations that you required. Right, so let me go through that. The 19th lecture. And this one actually we did not discuss. Uh, if you remember, uh, about this is about the distribution of galaxies. And you have a recorded video for this one as well. So this uh, expansion of the universe is uh, discovered by Hubble uh, in uh, around 1920s. So he used first, if you remember, he, he was the one that you, who used the SEPID uh, variables to measure the distances to a large number of spiral galaxies. And he was the found that this Andromeda is a different galaxy that is away from us. And, uh, and then the best, uh, he found there is a connection between the galaxy's distance and the size of the redshift as well. And if you go through this 19th lecture, you will see the, the more information about it. And then uh, he has this Hubble's law, right, from that information and uh, from the Hubble law. Uh, keep in mind that the reason that I am just going to very briefly here, yeah, I have explained everything in this recorded lecture, right? So you can go that and go through that in detail. So I don't want to repeat the same thing again. And so what he found is there is a nice relationship between the velocity and the distance like this using that. Uh, so that's how he said that galaxies are right shifting and now universe is expanding. And uh, now by having all this information, you can see that I have no information here about, you know, it says that the universe is expanding, but I have not mentioned anything like, uh, and here is this Hubble's law. Uh, it's a very simple law. It's not equal V over D. V is the velocity that the particular galaxy is receding away from us. D is the distance to that particular galaxy and H naught is the Hubble constant, right? So it's a constant that comes in terms of kilometers per second per megaparsec. So that's the unit. So sometimes it is also written as kilometers per million light years, right? And this, this is a universal constant that will be same everywhere. And there is an example that I have given how to find the distance to a particular galaxy. If you know that how fast a particular galaxy is moving away from us. Now, uh, so I have, uh, mentioned here about the redshift as well. Now, this information is what you need to answer that question, right? Now, you can see that there are a lot of information, but you need to get, you know, the idea, okay, about the Hubble constant, what it tells you, what is that relationship, uh, and then if you find it, find the distance here, you need to find how fast the particular galaxy is moving away from us. Now, for that, uh, to find how fast a particular galaxy is moving away from us, you need to know the redshift of that particular galaxy. So this is uh, where you have the information about the redshift. It says the distance to a galaxy is derived from, the, from its redshift. Uh, and astronomers measure the galaxy's redshift from its spectrum using and then use the Hubble constant plus the model of the universe to turn the redshift into a distance, right? And use the distance and the constant speed of light to infer how far back in the time they are seeing the galaxy. And this is actually have a specific name that we, we call use as the look back time of the galaxy. And you can see the equation that you need to find the redshift, right? So this is the formula for the Doppler redshift. And this formula you need to remember and also keep in mind, this is not the first time that I am introducing this formula. This was also in the notes about the orbits and gravity as well. That was the first time. I mean, uh, it's it's around that area, orbits and gravity. Oh, in the following lecture, I can't remember which one exactly, but if you followed those lectures, you will have it. 
and uh, you can uh, see how you find the rate shift. Rate shift is denoted by Z, right? So when you need to find the rate shift, you need to get the delta lambda. So that is the shift of the wavelength, observed wavelength, and the lambda is the wavelength emitted by the source. So that is the original wavelength. And I have given an example here. There is a line in the spectrum of a galaxy, uh, which is at a wavelength of 393 nanometers uh, when the source is at rest. And then there is a measured wavelength shifted by seven, this amount, 7.86 nanometers. So it's, that means that delta lambda, the shift of the wavelength is the delta lambda, that is 7.86. And then the original wavelength, that is the rest wavelength, it is 393. So you just need to divide those numbers to get the answer, right? Now you can see that in this um, astronomy lecture, you don't have like very huge equations. But the thing is, these equations are new for you. You need to understand what that equation means. Right? what kind of things that you should plug in to get these values. The basic idea is the understanding here and then you sometimes have to remember these basic equations. Now, I expect you to remember these kind of equations like the equation for the red shift, right? And you can see, you know, when you, if you go through the notes, I have given the examples also for those kind of things. So in your exam paper, that is what is asked here. So you are give, given the rest wavelength and then you are also given the shift of the wavelength, delta lambda. So you just divide, need to divide this value from 400. Right? So that's all you have to do. And I saw that even in the last exam, most of the students have not answered for these type of questions. Right? Now this is why I decided to change the way I am teaching this, uh, at least for the last part, so that you will get a better understanding. Right? Uh, to how to apply what you have learned. So basically in the exam paper, what you are doing is you can see that you are applying what you have learned, right? So that's how you find the value of the red shift. So that is uh, that delta Z value. And then you need to find the receding velocity, how fast that particular galaxy is moving away from us. For that actually, here is the equation. So this red shift value of Z is uh, related with the receding velocity and the velocity of light, which is a constant that we all know. So if you need to find the receding velocity, then what you need to know is just multiply the value of the rate shift by the velocity of light. So it will tell you how fast a particular galaxy is moving away from us, right? So that's how you find the receding velocity. And then if you know the receding velocity, then the next question here is actually the distance to the galaxy. How to find the distance to the galaxy, right? So now it's straightforward. You can see that uh, 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 that uh, you can see here that there is a uh, this uh, equation about the Hubble's law right here, which is a distance equal uh, velocity divided by the Hubble constant, right? You can see that uh, if you know the receding velocity, then this uh, distance can be found easily. Right? So you just need to, need to divide the residing velocity by the Hubble constant. But there is one catch here you need to make sure that you are matching the units exactly. Otherwise, you will get wrong answers, right? You can see that the velocity has come in terms of, in here, in this particular example, right? Uh, so let me go back down here again. Now, when you use the velocity of light, if you use that in terms of kilometers per second, your receding velocity will come in terms of kilometers per second, right? Now, you can see that something that we don't pay much attention in usually the units of the values that you are getting is playing a very major role in, in astronomy, right? So all the, the answers that you are calculating will, you know, highly depend on what kind of units that you are using. So it will come in terms of kilometers per second. Then you have to be careful here. 
when you use the Hubble constant, so Hubble constant will usually, if you need the Hubble constant, this will be given in your exam paper, right? However, when I am giving the exam paper, I make you two Hubble, two numbers for the Hubble constant with two types of units. Then you need to make sure that you need you are using the correct one. Because I could give like Hubble constant as let's say 70 kilometers per second per mega passage. So that is one way of giving the Hubble constant. Here I have given Hubble constant 20 kilometers per second per million years, right? So then it's a different one. So make sure that you are using the correct uh, format for the correct position, right? Since we have measured the receding velocity in terms of kilometers per second, then your Hubble constant I have given here is still 22 kilometers per second per million light years. Then you can see that these two units will cancel out and your answer will come for the distance in terms of million light years, right? And uh, if you are using the other type of unit, that means the 70 kilometers per second per mega parsecs, still that's okay. But then your final answer for the distance will come in terms of mega parsecs, right? So that means the units play an important role here, right? So make sure that you uh, keep that in mind, right? Uh, right, so this is how you find you know, the look back time and those kind of things, right? Uh, so I just need to show you how to answer this question now. Uh, what I am checking here is from the knowledge that you have gained in the class, and all the equations and all the things that whether you can find the distance to a particular galaxy. So that's the idea, right? So there is a process that you have to understand and then you have to apply for that, right? So that's what I am checking here. So make sure that you understand these key points, right? And then uh, the part, so I hope you got the idea, right? So you that particular question is based on this uh, this part, uh, the lecture that I have not discussed, you know, live with you, but I have gave you the recorded details. And then uh, you can see that there are some more information here, right, about the redshift dependence of the star formation. So the redshift dependent of the star formation is this particular diagram. Now you know the redshift itself means higher the redshift that means you are looking at a larger distance right so that's what uh, this particular uh, uh, equation tells you because if the redshift value is higher your receding velocity will be very high you receive what that means is if your receding velocity is very high then according to this particular equation you are looking at higher distances Right? So these are the things that you need to understand and relate to each other. These are simple equations, but you need to understand and logically connect uh, these equations to each other. Right? So D equal V over H. So that means if your uh, velocity is, uh, receding velocity is higher, and then uh, the distance is uh, huge, right? So distance is very large. So that's how they are connected. So that means if your redshift value is higher, you are looking at larger look back times or higher distances. So what this particular uh, diagram tells you is that the star formation history of the universe, how the star formation has changed, right? Actually, this was in your syllabus at the first point. So that's why I'm putting it here. You can see that when the redshift increases, towards the x-axis, that means you are looking at larger and larger distances, right? And then if you look at the y-axis, that basically tells you the rate of star formation. And you can see it's in minus values and it's in log scales. When you go up, the rate increases. And there are uh, four different uh, ways of measuring star formation rates. One is UV, HF, IR, and value, and I'm not going to explain how those are connected and how they are work. And if you need to get an example for this, I will share you another video, which is basically my thesis defense, which is available in the YouTube. 
Uh, that was an HL five study in terms of the star formation in galaxy clusters. We will just get a glimpse or just get a basic idea about how this, H, for example, HL five measurement is related to the star formation rates in galaxies, right? To answer that question, because I don't have time to, you know, explain everything. You can see that when you go through the history of the universe, that means if you increase the redshift, there is an increase in the star formation rates up to redshift of one or 1.5 close to like that. And then after redshift of two or something, then star formation rate decreased a little bit, right? And this is actually called uh, this uh, specific Mandu diagram, uh, which is a, a diagram that explains the star formation rates or the history of star formation rate, right? So that is something, uh, something a little bit go outside what we have been talking. And, uh, and there are some uh, stories about, you know, the mergers and cannibalism, which means how galaxies interact uh, with each other, those kind of things, computer simulations, a lot of data. And I mean, this recorded video lecture will be pretty interesting for you. I mean, go back and look at it, right? And the distribution of galaxies in the space, how they are distributed. And there are very important concept here, which is about the basic cosmological principle. And I would like actually you to remember this cosmological principle, which is, you know, like the heart of the cosmology, if you are studying cosmology. So you should know about that principle. And this will be, this probably have explained in this uh, your lecture series, recorded lecture, right? And then about the galaxy clusters and some of these effects that you can see in the galaxy cluster, for example, gravitational lensing which is an idea again presented in Einstein's general theory of relativity. So you don't need to you know, get the equations and anything, but uh, you have to get the idea, right? Not the equations in those kind of situations, right? Hmm. So then large and small Magellanic clouds details, those kind of things, right? So I guess you, you probably have gotten the idea like uh, what kind of things that I expect from you from these uh, last two, uh, lectures and let me go back to the next question now right so that that next question is actually not uh, directly from uh, uh, that section but it, it is asking briefly explain the process of formation of type 1a supernova starting from a white dwarf now you have to go back to the section about uh, the stellar evolution where I have explained you this formation of type 1 is supernova, right? So we have gone through those lectures. Basically, it is there, there, if there is a white dwarf and if you have a companion star nearby, that companion, uh, uh, the white dwarf will accrete matter from the companion star. And if the mass exceeds a certain limit, which is the 1.4 solar mass limit, which we also hold as the Chandrasekhar limit, then there will be a, you know, in the in the white dwarf, you have carbon in the core. So if you have enough mass that which exceeds the Chandrasekhar limit, then uh, uh, then you have to, you know, uh, the the whole star will explode, right? So we used to tell these type of uh, supernovas as carbon detonation supernova or a type one supernova, right? And uh, so you basically need to explain that process very briefly. You don't need to write, you know, like a one page essay for this. Just explain it in for it, even in point form, that should be enough if you are explaining the, the whole process that somebody in a way that you could, it could be understandable by someone, right? So you can see that we are dividing the, the lectures into different sections, but you know, you cannot, completely separate those, right? So the type one supernova is uh, always involving with measuring distances. So that's why it comes here as a question. And the next question is, how can we use type one A supernova to measure the distances to galaxies? And this one actually I'm not trying to explain, uh, I'm not trying to explain it here, but I have, you know, explained it many times for you. Uh, and just go back and look at the notes about the type 1a supernova. I have you know, shown you how to how type 1a supernova is used to measure the distances, right? So that is another story. And then this type 1a again comes in this last lecture. 
so there is a question is that is telling explain how astronomers discovered the universe is accelerating instead of deaccelerating using the measurements of type 1a supernova now this is one of the very important findings which also led to the nobel prize as well and you can see that in the last lecture so let me go back to the last lecture lecture number 20 so i'm just briefly explaining but remember that there is uh, a link to the lecture 20 right here if you go to this youtube video right here you will uh, Get a lot of information. So, for the just for your information, let me just share. Recording. So you can see that, right? I have been explaining so, it one and a half hours. So you will get a lot of information. And this section about the uh, the supernova. And this way, it is easy to uh, mention what happens to the universe. So let me switch off the. Here is the story about, I guess, the documents. So let me see. So if you go through this lecture, you will see somewhere here about, you know, and the, I am again starting talking about the supernova. So that means in, you can see there is a way universe is accelerating. You can see from the slide here how they found that the universe is accelerating. And this is based on the measurements of the type 1A supernovas, right? And uh, because, uh, you know, from the Hubble law that you have seen, it seems like it's the acceleration is like a constant, right? But it is not the case when you use this uh, independent measurements from the type 1A supernova for the distances, they have found that the universe is actually accelerating. And I have explained it here very clearly how they found it. So just go and look at it, we'll understand. So that's what I am asking here about the lecture number two. And now if you go to the the note also, note is right here. So let me, so that's the last one about the Big Bang. You can see, uh, this is about the expanding universe and the Hubble time, age of the universe. Uh, and then here, uh, I have talked about the universal acceleration. So that's about actually, uh, because yeah, from the Hubble's law, uh, astronomers knew that the universe was expanding, but the, pro the question they had was whether this expansion will slow down or whether it has accelerated, uh, that kind of question, right? So for that actually, they need specific requirements. Uh, so they, they actually spent several decades looking for evidence that the expansion of the universe will deaccelerate. Because you know the, the problem is that what, what they were, I mean, that made sense because when you when things get apart each other, the effect of the gravity is less. Like you know, the when the distance increases. So they were thinking about maybe there will be a deacceleration at the end for this expansion. But even though they were looking at the acceleration, they found completely opposite thing. So what has happened was when they looked at, they were actually uh, looked from the larger telescopes, they measure the redshift of distant galaxies. So they measure the redshift values, which you can, you know, uh, find the distances independently. And then they have used uh, the this type one the supernova. Right, uh, to look at uh, the distance as well. From these observations, they found that instead of deaccelerating, the universe is actually accelerating. Right, so that was the first time they found that in 1990s that the universe was accelerating, not deaccelerating. Right now, and this 
this made a question mark in everyone's mind because now if you if our universe is actually the expansion is accelerating instead of slowing down there should be some kind of force that drives this right and we we know for sure that that is not the the gravitational force so there should be some kind of force that drives this acceleration okay? because the universe is accelerating this made a huge question mark in everyone's mind right and this is the point that the astronomers introduced the, and you can see in this uh, this image that how they have used this uh, supernova uh, super type one supernovas uh, for this uh, measure to measure this accelerating universe. So that's the question that I have asked there. Uh, now the problem is then the next question came into their mind is how this can be because if the universe is accelerating. There should be some kind of force or something that drives this flow and uh, but uh, I mean, if, for example, if you want to accelerate the car, then you need to supply some extra energy, right? So you need to, you, there is an accelerator that you can supply more gas or the more petrol, and then you can supply that uh, extra energy that you need to accelerate the car. There should be some kind of thing like that to accelerate it. So that particular entity that will accelerate the universe astronomers call whatever that amount will be the dark energy. So that is how the, this dark energy term came into play. Right? And you need to, there is one thing that you have to make it clear. Uh, this new component that we are interested in now, for, that we, we, we believe as the responsible entity for this uh, acceleration of the universe, which is dark energy, is not the same as the dark matter. Right? The dark matter that we have talked in the chapter about the galaxies is actually matter that is invisible inside galaxies. However, they actually uh, create the same effect as the gravity. So they, they, they act as an attractive force, right? like the gravitational attraction. But the dark energy is completely different. Thing. It is actually responsible for the acceleration of the universe, right? It's kind of an anti-gravity type of thing, right? Uh, uh, so the dark, in dark matter, we don't know exactly what it is, and dark energy also we have never detected in our laboratory, so anywhere like that, right? But there are compelling evidence that dark energy exists, but the, the problem is we don't know yet what is the source of this dark energy. Right, so that's uh, the story. And then in this lecture, the last one, this last piece of uh, information is about the Big Bang, how the universe is created and how it is expanded and what are the different models that we have to explain the fate of the universe, right? And there is something called critical density of the universe that we used to talk. And this is one important parameter as well. And there is a, there is a question based on this. And critical density is normally defined using this term. Actually, I am not proving any of these things because this proof comes from the general the equations that we have derived for the general theory of relativity, which are called as the Friedman equations. And we are not talking, of, we are actually not going into that far in your course. And uh, then, based on this critical density, if the value of the critical density you, based on that value, whether it's to be whether it will be greater than one, uh, equal to one, or less than one, then you will decide what kind of universe that we are living, right? So those are the things that we discussed. And one important thing is that uh, this Big Bang, when the Big Bang happens, at the, that is the beginning of the universe, I have also explained here what kind of environment was there and what has happened at the first point, right? So go through that uh, those lectures and then you will understand most of these things, right, that I have mentioned here about the cosmic microwave background, why it is important, because these things will appear in the, in the in your exam, right, because I have discussed 
those things in those recorded lectures. So the idea of having those recorded lectures is that you get these ideas clearly. Right. And let me go back to this slide again and so briefly explain the process of formation of type 1A supernova starting from white dwarf. So we, we know how to answer that. And then the second one is how to use the type 1A supernova to measure the distances to galaxies. And then the third one is related to this, that last section, how this type 1A supernova was helpful to discover the universe is accelerating, right? So make sure that you go through and understand it. I will also post the answers, model answers for this question paper as well for you to refer. However, uh, you will not learn anything just by looking at the answers, right? So you need to relate these things because you will not get the same question again now in the next exam paper. This is just to learn for you, right? How to answer the questions. And then the last question was, how do you define the cosmological density parameter? And this is, uh, to be honest, that's something that you have to remember in your scale because uh, we are not proving it. And here is how you, uh, I, was, I think it was there. Here is how you uh, uh, define the cosmological density parameter. So that is the observed density of the universe divided by the critical density of the universe, right? And based on that, we will define the fate of the universe. And then the next questions are briefly explain the composition of the universe based on the cosmological density parameter. So that is again, uh, uh, composition of the universe based on the cosmological parameter because if you go down, you will see that this cosmological density parameter has actually few other components, right? Here is the, the composition. You can see that this cosmological density parameter has three, three uh, components. The normal matter, that is the matter that we used to study and the dark matter and the dark energy, right? right? So make sure that you understand that composition. And then I have given you some more details about the curvatures of the universe. You can see that there are a lot of information, uh, but just get the idea as much as possible, right? Right, and the, the last one is calculate the cosmological density parameter and decide the geometry of the universe. Now, to calculate, the, once you know how to find the composition of the universe, uh, based on the cosmological density parameter, calculation is just very simple. Uh, because you just need to add those three components, right? So the, uh, so the amount of, you know, composition is this one and the, the density parameter you need to calculate is just the addition of these three, right? 0.7 plus 0.25 plus 0 0.05. So basically that will be uh, uh, very close to one, right? That is another question actually that we have if the cosmological density parameter is one, then we used to tell that we are living in a flat universe. And uh, the question is how to tune this universe in that such a way that it becomes flat now, right? So that is another question that we have. And uh, this cosmic microwave background actually answers some of these questions. So make sure that you go through it and try to find uh, those answers. Right. So that basically explains you how to answer this final question. Right? After I'm done with all the lectures, I will actually upload the model answers for you. Uh, but uh, you will still make sure that you still have to understand this thing clearly. Right? Now in my tutorial also, if you go to this problem set 2, I mean, you don't have to submit this. And you can still straight away see that the first question is something similar to that was appeared in the exam as well, right? This orbit of the galaxy is, uh, you know, the, the period is given and the radius is given. You are asking to estimate the mass, right? 
and then there is a question about draw the hubble classification of galaxies and explain the distinguished features of each classification this is something i have not uh, discussed in the class itself but if you go to that uh, section last section about the galaxies and there is a recorded video for you that that explain this classification system very completely and you should get a good idea about that right now you have a questions now what kind of things that i will ask in a, in an exam so these are the things that you will be tested there will be nothing new right i mean you just i will be testing you to check whether you know this basic information about the classification of galaxies and uh, then there was a question why did it take so long for the existence of other galaxies to be established so that is basically the reason is that because we didn't have a proper method mechanism or proper method to measure the dis larger distances right the only method that we had at that time was to measure the parallax angles which will not work for larger distances and here, here are the, what are the two best ways to measure the distances to nearby spiral galaxies and how would it be measured now you can see that the questions that appeared in the exam paper and the questions that i am asking here is kind of the same thing right but they are i mean i mean the way that what what i have asked is and the way that i have asked is the difference but the content is same because i you know there is nothing that i want to ask from you that you don't know right and then explain what is mass light ratio and why it is smaller in spiral galaxies with regions of a star formation than elliptical galaxies now you probably know the all the answers for these questions now right I mean, the same thing I have also discussed in the past paper as well. It is that the way that I have asked is different, but the, what I am checking the, in terms of conceptual, uh, uh, in terms of the concept, basically I am checking the same thing. And then what is the recessional velocity of a galaxy that is 10 to the power 8 light years away from us? So that's also what I have already discussed with you. Because uh, once you know the Hubble constant, once you know the distance, you just need the Hubble Hubble's law to find the velocity, right? It's kind of inverse what I have discussed in the uh, just a uh, few minutes ago with you. And then there is a uh, question about whether it is possible it is possible to derive the age of the universe given the value of the Hubble constant and the distance to a galaxy with the assumption that the value of the Hubble constant has not changed since the Big Bang. Consider the galaxy at a distance of 400 million light years receding from us at the velocity of V if the Hubble constant is 70, find the age. And that question needs to find the age of the universe. Now, if you go to this, uh, this the lecture about the distribution of galaxies and the last one, I have clearly explained how to find the age of the universe by step by step in certain slides so go back and look at it you can find the answer for this one right now what is important is write these answers yourself you know where to find the answers right so try to find the answers and write those yourself then once i post these solutions you will better understand it whether your answers are correct or not because in this uh, distance mode i don't have a way of you know correcting all of your answers but you can do it yourself right and then the last one, the number eight is actually about finding the distance to a, the galaxy large Magellanic cloud using the period luminosity relationship, right? So you can see that if you have completed this tutorial, this is basically the same tutorial that I gave last year as well for the second one. And if you have done those, the question paper basically asking uh, the same concepts, not the same questions, right? You, I cannot, you know, Test different concepts now. I have to check what I have taught, right? And you can see the separate star is given, the apparent magnitude is given, and you are given the period of that. And there is a graph at the end. So once you know the period, you can find the absolute magnitude from that. If you know the absolute and apparent magnitude, you know how to find the distance, right? So that's how it is uh, done. And then I have four different uh, topics to describe to you briefly. 
and basically if you watch the recorded video and if you listen to me and work with me with this today's lecture and if you do go through this tutorial and complete the answers then actually you can cover most of the parts right it is going through the notes is also important but uh, what actually happens is when you complete these tutorials, the tutorial is made in such a way that you have to go through the notes to complete, right? Then you will understand the concepts and it, it will be much easier for you at the end for your exams. Right, I think I have covered uh, the last two sections in a different way, but I, I guess it will be helpful for you. Now, anybody have any questions up to here before I wind up the today's session? Any questions? Uh, one thing I now need to know from you. Uh, I, as far as I know, your uh, exams are in next month, right? Am I correct? Right, okay. Now there is uh, one lecture that I would like to take, which will be one and a half hour. And as far as I, I, are you done with, is, is it your study leave starting from the next week or do you have lectures in the next week as well? How about that? Could you please uh, let me know about it. Right, so next week you have study leave. And uh, there is actually one uh, lecture that will be remaining. I will try to cover it up tomorrow, but if I couldn't, I will do it on one of, at night, one of those weekdays in your study leave. And I hope that will be okay with you because uh, I am not going to do a lecture in the last one, last one and a half hours. What I am do, doing again will be, I will try to discuss those, the first two problems in the exam paper in the last year, together with the first tutorial, right? So just to show you the connections that you have between the notes and the concepts to get you an idea to prepare for you for the exam, how to answer for the exam, right? So that is the idea and I hope nobody will uh, oppose with that. I am. I will try to do it tomorrow, but there is an issue, uh, a personal issue for me to conduct lectures tomorrow. But if that is the case, then I will take one of your nights to complete that lecture, the, that part, the lecture. And I hope that if, if you have any issues with that, please let me know, right? So if you have issues with, you know, having a one and a half hour lecture in the study leave, like an online lecture and let me know. However, it will not, I, I hope that it will not, you know, uh, distract you as I am not doing a lecture, right? So what I am doing is just a, a kind of a revision class that will help you for, to start for your studies for the exam, right? So that is the idea. Right. So if you do not have any question, then let me stop uh, today's lecture and I will meet you for the final day. That would be, I will try to do it tomorrow morning or tomorrow evening. I will update you. If not, there will be one day at night uh, during your study leave, some, some day at night. Uh, it could be most probably I will try to complete it on Monday night, depending on the work I have. Or Monday morning because Monday is a holiday as far as I know, and then uh, then you will you are you will be you are done with all the lectures and you are prepared and you can prepare for the exams, right? Also, if you have questions, come up with those questions on the next day, right? So there will be no chances after that for you to you know answer the questions because uh, 
you will be done with all the lectures after the final one right right so let me stop here if you do not have any questions so we will meet again uh, uh, meet again on next uh, day for the final class right right uh, good morning and uh, we will see you again on tomorrow day after tomorrow